Just this past week, we celebrated the feast of Our Lady of Prompt Succor, a feast that we ought to be aware of and appreciate with regard to the history of our own country. And so I take my sermon today from an article that I wrote for the Rainy Mary magazine on Our Lady of Prompt Succor. This article was written when I was in major orders, and so it was printed in the Rainy Mary back in 88. Quoting St. Alphonsus Maria Liguri, Mary, even when living in this world, showed at the marriage feast of Cana the great compassion that she would afterwards exercise towards us in our necessities, and which now, as it were, forces her to have pity on us and assist us even before we ask her to do so. From this, Novarinus argues that if Mary, unasked, is thus prompt to succor the needy, how much more so will she be to succor those who invoke her and ask for her help? To Miss Frances Agatha Jensul, the calling to America as an Ursuline sister was both a challenge and an invitation. The challenge, life in the new world, an opportunity for the spread of the faith and an abundant labor among the Catholics who had so few to provide for their spiritual needs. An invitation to a life not permitted her in her own homeland, the peaceful serenity of cloistered convent life. Once again might she be known as Mother St. Michael and take the habit once so painfully set aside in revolution-torn France. As a young nun, she had been forced from her convent, Pont Saint-Esprit, and frustrated as well was her ardent desire to work for the education of youth. Returning to her family, the exiled religious took the first opportunity to continue this apostolate, even though not yet permitted the joy of community life. The opportunity was afforded when, with the worst of the revolutionary spirit spent, a more stable government tolerated her opening of a boarding school for girls in Montpellier in 1802. Her endeavor, her endeavors, so well cultivated in her young students, those qualities called forth by her religious institute, that this spiritual daughter of St. Angela de Merici was shortly called upon by Monsignor Fournier, Bishop of Montpellier, to revive the Episcopal City's Ursuline Convent, suppressed at the time of the Revolution. Yet at the same time came a plea from across the Atlantic. Mother St. Michael's cousin, Sister Christine Madier de Saint Andre, implored her help at the Ursuline Convent in New Orleans, where she had dedicated herself to Christian education even before the outbreak of the French Revolution. Even the New World had felt the effects of the religious and political upheavals in France. A new revolutionary spirit replaced the influence of Catholic Spain. Only a handful of nuns remained in the midst of the now overwhelming duties. Most had sought refuge in Havana from the prospect of religious persecution. 
to Mother St. Michael, the choice was made. While both France and America offered ample room for her spirit of dedication, it would be long before she could enjoy the happiness of religious life in her native France. At least the distant New World promised freedom to enjoy the serenity of community life and the strength it would afford to shoulder such overwhelming labors for the love of God. The hope was distant to see the Ursulines restored in France, but here was ready and waiting not only a convent, but an academy, day school, orphanage. Indeed, it seemed a consent call. If only Bishop, <clears throat> if only Bishop Fournier might understand the longing of her soul. <clears throat> With desire to see the convent of Montpellier, again resounding with God's praises. The bishop's refusal was almost unconditional. The only way he would allow her departure would be if the Pope himself gave permission. Certainly any less heroic soul might have given up all hope. Pope Pius VII was then confined a prisoner by Napoleon, but not Mother St. Michael. In her plight, she pleaded to Our Lady and promised to spread devotion to her in New Orleans under the title of Our Lady of Prompt Succor if she received a speedy and favorable reply from the imprisoned pontiff. Was it Our Lady's desire to be venerated in the New World as Our Lady of Prompt Succor, the reason for her prompt response to Mother St. Michael's pleas? Her letter did indeed reach the Holy Father, and a favorable reply was forthcoming. Bishop Fournier could but acquiesce to the evident will of God, as he blessed the statue to be born to its new sanctuary in the new world, a future haven of the promised devotion. Nor was this the first and only time Our Lady had interceded with her prompt assistance, the New Orleans Foundation, Sister St. Andre had prayed before a similar statue of Our Lady secured from the lumber room of her French convent, asking prompt assistance in obtaining permission to come to America. In spite of the difficulties of in spite of the difficulties and cold reception offered by Spanish officials. Sister St. Andre had promised to spread devotion to our Blessed Mother and to bear the beloved statue with her if the obstacles were speedily overcome. Mother St. Michael's statue was the same image as that of her cousin's. The convent seemed reinvigorated with devotion to Our Lady and greatly aided by the efforts of Mother St. Michael and her assistants. Yet the cross was not long in coming. The city was shortly prey to uncontrolled fires spreading in the direct path of the convent. Amidst the anguish of the citizens and the fury of the flames, the sisters kept up their hope 
Falling on their knees, Mother St. Michael implored the aid of the convent's heavenly patroness, Our Lady of Prompt Succor. We are lost unless you come to our succor. Again, the reply was prompt. A shifting wind drove the flames away from the convent and abated the fury that had defied all human resistance. But a few years of serenity followed before another alarming event was to prove the protection of Our Lady of Prompt Succor. It was the year 1815. A superior British army was advancing under General Packingham for an easy victory over the inexperienced militia commanded by General Andrew Jackson. With full realization of the fate of the nation should New Orleans fall, the stern resolve of the American general was to set the city afire rather than sacrifice its hold to the enemy. Answering the alarm, every able man took a position in the lines awaiting the British onslaught. With no less valiant an effort did the women of the city gather before the statue, the shrine of Our Lady of Prompt Succor. Having spent the entire night kneeling in prayer and imploring Our Lady's protection for their husbands and beloved, these resolute women trustfully laid the fate of their city at the feet of their heavenly advocate. With the beloved statue placed over the altar, the very Reverend Monsignor du Bourg began the holy sacrifice to call down the blessing of the God of hosts. The most solemn moments of Mass arrived. With the distinct clamor of the bloody fray in the distance, Domine non sum dignus, the hushed moment of the communion. Time seemed to stop. The silence was short-lived. The frightful volley of distant muskets could no longer be heard from the city's trench line of defense. Instead, cries of jubilation and exultant shouting filled the streets. The chapel door burst open as a soldier of the city's defenders cried out, Victory! Victory! At once the Te Deum was intoned and taken up by a wave of grateful hearts. General Jackson himself soon came with his officers to express their gratitude for the sisters' prayers, which he had personally requested. He publicly acknowledged the intervention of heaven and shortly afterwards assisted at the solemn mass of thanksgiving. Since then, this solemn Mass of Thanksgiving has been offered annually by vow in the city of New Orleans. Pope Pius IX instituted the Feast of Our Lady of Prompt Succor in 1851 for the New Orleans Archdiocese. The shrine was further honored in 1891 as Pope Leo XIII decreed the solemn coronation of the miraculous statue, the first such ceremony to be held in the United States of America. Such honors clearly show that devotion to Our Lady of Prompt Succor is not a mere commemoration of the past. Whether our needs be momentous or simply the daily trials of everyday life, 
we ought to turn to her with childlike abandonment and trust. For those of us here in America, the devotion to Our Lady of Prumpsucker is a heritage of our Catholic faith and a shining ray of hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.